That is not me. That's the microphone boom. Although I feel a bit like that myself. Uh, let me remind you that tomorrow evening, our time with Lucille Clifton uh, is extended to one more event in, uh, at the college at the uh, college in Brother Junipers at 7:30, when her master's composition workshop will hold uh, a kind of collective reading uh, led by Lucille Clifton. Uh, that's tomorrow evening at 7:30 at Brother Junipers. And uh, Lenny and Mike, who work at Brother Junipers, tell me it's okay if you want to bring a, a Botello Divino. Uh, they'll be glad to uncork it for you, no fee, and furnish glasses, which may be uh, somewhat less than official wine glasses, but they'll furnish them anyway, and they'll wash them too. So that's, that's, it's, a, it's a great day at the College Inn. And Friday night at 7 or 7.30, 7. Brett Singer, whose hand you see the back of right now, and uh, Frederick Keppel will be reading their works at Burke's Bookstore at 7.30 Friday evening, at 7 o'clock Friday evening, 7 o'clock Friday evening. Okay. So to work. Lucille Clifton was born in Depew, New York in 1936, the daughter of a steel worker. She was educated at Howard University and State University of New York College at Fredonia. Her first book of poems, Good Times, 1969, was cited as one of the year's best 10 books by the New York Times Book Review. Other books of poetry include Good News About the Earth, 72, an Ordinary Woman, 74, Two-Headed Woman, 80, Good Woman, Poems and a Memoir, 87, Next, New Poems, 87, and a recent publication, The Book of Light. She served as Poet Laureate of Maryland from 1979 to 1982. The poet has also written extensively for children besides seven volumes in the Everett Anderson series, published between 1970 and 1983. She has produced a dozen other books for young readers. In 1984, Clifton received the Coretta Scott King Award for Everett Anderson's Goodbye. You may have seen her on Bill Moyer's series program, The Power of the Word. We're grateful and honored that Lucille Clifton has spent the past semester in residence with us, working with our graduate poetry seminar. She calls herself a poem doctor, but this is an understated moment in her jive. Her gift is to see what is important or what leads to importance in a piece of work. Perhaps it is a phrase leading to a living voice, perhaps a subject that moves in the present draft, a subject that is latent but unpenetrated by the work as it now stands. Perhaps it is simply um, that the moves in the present draft occur in a less than useful order. Her talent is to teach people to write their strongest work. If a line falls short of effective, she is ruthless about getting it out and searching for another, a better one. Work at it until you, the author, and your poem are one. Our students will go on for years to come hearing her questions and suggestions for their work. Her passion is for the art form, for where it leads the writer committed to it. Nor do I mean to describe some usual liberal dis -historied attachment to an art form, Miss Clifton's passion is also for historical engagement, even as one enters history by accepting truths from all the margins in the center. In her poem, Cycle About Crazy Horse, 
in The Death of Crazy Horse, Lucille Clifton has written, In the hills where the hoop of the world bends to the four directions, Wakan Tanka has shown me the path men walk in shadow. So I dreamed, and I dreamed, and I endured. Remember our name, Lakota. I am released from shadow. My horse dreams and dances under me as I enter the actual world. She believes that to enter life, one has to accept the myth of oneself, to make it active, to dream one's, two relation, one's true relation to things, and then act upon that dream. The poem is the language of incarnation of such dreaming. The poem furnishes the mathematics of line and stanza. Love is the radical that makes truth the only satisfaction of unknowns. Her poems touch on rebirth in the truth of oneself, on hypocrisy and injustice, especially in their poses of liberal pieties, but above all on the hand-me-downs of experience and creations of narratives, mother to daughters, woman to woman, woman to man, all in, quote, a language more actual than speech, unquote. Lucille remakes the myths one after the other, among others the Garden of Eden stories, the convenient fantasy of orthodox education, life after the log cabin of which she writes, I am accused of tending to the past as if I made it, as if I sculpted it with my own hands. I did not. The past was waiting for me when I came, a monstrous unnamed baby, and I, with my mother's itch, took it to breast and named it history. She is more human now, learning language every day, remembering faces, names, and dates, and when she is strong enough to travel on her own, beware, she will. Her work is not all forgiving and all nourishing. Her word is sharp for ignorance of history and righteous stupidity in cultural experience. Nor does she differentiate between the remembering accurate mercies of poems and a heart's generosities as essential to life giving. And it is Lucille Clifton's highest purpose to give life. Walt Whitman is her muse in that fine collection of family history narratives, Generations, a memoir. Quote, I do not trouble my spirit to vindicate itself or be understood. I see that the elementary laws never apologize. She keeps faith with those people whose names and blood she shares in those memoirs. She was born with six fingers, and we all know what that means. She wrote about it, of course. I began with everything, parents, two extra fingers, a brother to ruin. I was a rich girl with no money in a red dress. How did I come to sit in this house wearing a name I never heard until I was a woman? Someone has stolen my parents and hidden my brother. My extra fingers are cut away. I am left with plain hands and nothing to give you but poems. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lucille Clifton. Hi. Uh, I wanted to say two things. First of all, when my first book was published, my children were seven, five, four, three, two, and one. There is nothing any child in here can do I have not seen. I think it's wonderful to have a room with children and older people all together. Absolutely, babe. So I think it's fine. I think it's fine. Uh, I also would like everybody who's in the poetry workshop and who's going to read tomorrow night, if they're here, to raise their hands. See all these good people? You can hear tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. 
and Brother Junipers. Poems like you wouldn't believe. Um, I, I never know what I'm going to read, but I've written poems in Memphis, and uh, I wanted to read, it seemed only right that I should read some of them. Uh, I want to thank you all for being good friends to me, for allowing me to see without uh, being annoyed at what I saw. Uh, I want to thank especially my, I have a poem called Angels, and one is Angel Dark and Angel Fair, and that has to be Colleen and Angela, who are by Angel Dark and Angel Fair. And to thank everybody who has been my friend. Uh, too many people to name. When somebody asks me what I do, why, I, why do I write poems? What's this all about? I said I come to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> so maybe that's what I'm going to do. Who knows? Uh, one of the, I have never lived in the South. This is my first time. Of course, I live in Maryland, and that's the South, but Maryland doesn't think so. And so I go along with that. Uh, I've traveled all over the country. I've read in every state, including Hawaii and Alaska. But this is my first time in living in the South. And since I know no geography, I didn't know this was, uh, I knew it was near the Mississippi River. I didn't know it was on the Mississippi River. I didn't know that the state of Mississippi was like a spit away. Uh, I didn't know any of that. So, so I had to learn some things and feel my way. What I do sometimes is feel my way uh, in it. And one of the first things I thought about is just as humans are, a, are a, a summation of everything that you've experienced, everything that you've uh, been, learned, understood, um, negative and positive, so are places. And one of the things I think that happens is people think that history goes away, you know? And it doesn't. It doesn't. And Memphis, I think, is a place where history is just under the surface, but there. You know what I mean? Anyway, this poem has as its title what is also its first line. The Mississippi River empties into the Gulf. And the Gulf enters the sea, and so forth. None of them emptying anything. All of them carrying yesterday forever on their white-tipped backs. All of them dragging forward tomorrow. It is the great circulation of the Earth's body, like the blood of the gods, this river in which the past is always flowing. Every water is the same water coming round. Every day, someone is standing on the edge of this river, staring into time, whispering mistakenly, just here, just now. <clears throat> um, this is a poem written when I first came here. Now, this for me is long because it's two pages. For me, that's like war and peace, you know. <laughs> um, maybe I'll call it war and peace. Um, a lot of people know that I'm fortunate. I wrote a book called Generations, which is about my four, four mothers who came to this country, and they came from among the Dahomey people on the African continent. And uh, I used to hear all the time from my father, do what you want to, you from Dahomey women. And I really went for that, you know. Uh, I also went for wherever you are, you are supposed to be there, or you wouldn't be there. That works. <laughs> and uh, when I came to Memphis, I thought, because I was born in, near Buffalo, New York, on Lake Erie, I wanted to see about the South, you know. Now, the South, for a little girl uh, who looks a lot like me, in Buffalo, New York, was kind of scary. I remember the first time my fa I know my father went South, he was from Virginia, and he thought Virginia, we thought Virginia was heaven for a long time. We thought if people are good, they go to heaven. If they're very good, they go to Virginia, because that's what he told us. Um, I remember when he was first going South, and I was petrified. I was so scared. I didn't know what it all meant. I had so many questions about it. Anyway, this poem is called Memphis. It has an epithing. I never know whether it's an epigram or an epigraph, and because I don't worry about it, I say epithing. The epithing is, at the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand. I was raised on the shore of Lake Erie. E is for escape. There are more S's in Mississippi than my mother had sons. This river never knew the kingdom of Dahomey. The first S begins in slavery, 
and ends in Y on the bluffs of Memphis. Why are you here, the river wonders, northern born. Looking across from Buffalo, you look into Canada. Toronto is the name of the lights burning at night. The bottom of Memphis drops into the nightmare of a little girl's fear. In 15 minutes, I could be there. They could be here. Mississippi, not the river, the state. Schwerner and Cheney and Goodman. Medgar. Schwerner and Cheney and Goodman and Medgar. My mother had one son. He died gently near Lake Erie. Some rivers flow back from toward the beginning. I never learned to swim. Will I float or drown in this Memphis on the Mississippi River? What is this Southland? What has this to do with Egypt or with Dahomey or with me? So many questions, Northern born. Oh, this is a poem. For this poem to work, you have to know the lyrics to Old Man River. Surely you know the lyrics to Old Man River. I mean, what a drag if you don't, you know what I mean? Old Man River. Now, maybe I was just being clever with this poem. Old Man River. Everything elegant but this water. Tables set with crystal at the tea shop. Miss Lady patting her lips with linen. Horses pure stock. Negras pure stock. Everything clear but this big muddy water. Don't say nothing. Must know something. There's some poems that were written also. Uh, before I got here, but were perfected, I think, perfected, were, were worked on while I was here. And this is one. I was reading about slave ships. Slave ships were the ships, now notice what I'm not saying. Slave ships were the ships that went to the African continent, picked up free people, and brought them here where they were enslaved. Notice what I did not say. I did not say they went to the African continent and got slaves and brought them back here. It's a whole different way of looking at it. Now, I like things to be named for what they are. You know what I mean? I want slave ships to be called, like, um, stay home, you know? Lock up everything you love. <laughs> you know, I want it to be named stuff like that. Three slave ships, among the many, three were called. One was called Jesus, one was called Angel, and one was called Grace of God. Slave ships. Loaded like spoons into the belly of Jesus, where we lay for weeks, for months, in the sweat and stink of our own breathing. Jesus, why do you not protect us? Chained to the heart of the angel, where the prayers we never tell are hot and red as our bloody ankles. Jesus, angel, can these be men who vomit us out from ships called Jesus, angel, grace of God unto a heathen country? Jesus, angel, ever again can this tongue speak? Can these bones walk? Grace of God, can this sin Live. Now, one of the things I do is I, I respond to the news. I'm a great newspaper person. I love, I am nosy is what it is. I am extremely nosy. And I always want to know what's going on in case I miss something. I used to not want to take naps when I was younger because I'd miss something. Uh, I don't know what, and I don't know what would happen if I missed it. But I have two poems. One is sort of fun, and one is not. And they are responses to the newspaper. Uh, I was very interested in the Beckwith trial. You know Byron Dela Beckwith? You know about this? You all have heard of this? Those of you who have not heard of it, ask somebody after the reading what that was all about. 
Uh, well, I was very interested in that. One of the things I was interested in was uh, Medgar Evers' son said that he wanted to be in this courtroom because his father was shot in the back. And he wanted to show in this courtroom, he wanted to show Beckwith his father's face. I thought that was quite something. And uh, I also had a lot of friends, friends, uh, who thought, well, Beckwith is so old now. You know, forget about it. That's the past. He's in, just an old man. And it, it's often true that time takes care of a whole lot of stuff, you know. Some stuff you don't have to worry about, just wait it out. But this poem, anyway, is sort of about that. The uh, title is from the newspaper, Beckwith found guilty of shooting Medgar Evers in the back, killing him in 1963. The son of Medgar will soon be older than Medgar. He came, he says, to show in this courtroom Medgar's face. The old man sits, turns toward his old wife, then turns away. He is sick, his old wife sighs. He is only a sick old man. Medgar isn't, wasn't, won't be. Now, the other thing that I responded to, and people say I have a lot of nerve. I do. I have all kinds of nerve. Well, you have to have, you know. And, and I will speak in voices. I speak, in, for, I speak uh, in a lot of personas. I will speak for this, this desk. I will, speak for the, I will speak for people living and dead. I will speak for animals. I have poems speaking for crabs and things. So anyway, this... Uh, title is from a news report. Woman cuts off husband's penis, later throws it from car window. It lay in my palm soft and trembled as a new bird. And I thought about authority and how it always insisted on itself, how it was master of the man, how it measured him, never was ignored or denied and how it promised there would be sweetness if it was obeyed, just like the saints do, like the angels. And I opened the window and held out my uncupped hand. I swear to God, I thought it could fly. <laughs> Isn't that awful? That's terrible. Well, that's just awful, you know. <laughs> Gee, <Gord. laughs> um, I generally, my birthday is June 27th. I'm not shilling for gifts, I'm just telling you that. Um, and I generally write myself a birthday poem. I think I, somebody's got to write me a birthday poem, and I haven't found people waiting around to do it, so. This poem is called June 20th. I will be born in one week to a frowned forehead of a woman and a man whose fingers will itch to enter me. She will crochet a dress for me of silver and he will carry me in it. They will do for each other all that they can, but it will not be enough. None of us know that we will not smile again for years, that she will not live long. In one week, I will emerge face first into their temporary joy. Now, I've written a lot about, uh, about my father's family in this country, but I wanted to reclaim my, my maternal line. Uh, my mother, uh, I wrote a story about my mother once called The Magic Mama, which was, she was magic. Her mother, um, uh, my grandmother was bonkers. Do you have? People have, I know I'm not the only human that has various uh, relatives who are nuts. <laughs> <laughs> You're lying if you say you don't. Um, my grandmother was, my grandmother thought I was 12 until she died. I had children at the time. And so of course she thought I was a genius because, um, which was kind of fun, I guess. Uh, I have four daughters and two sons. Uh, they're pretty people. I always say that if my daughters walked into the room, they would shine. They are so beautiful. Anyway, I wanted to reclaim us and the woman before my grandmother. So this is called Daughters. 
Woman who shines at the head of my grandmother's bed. Brilliant woman. I like to think you whispered into her ear instructions. I like to think you are the oddness in us. You are the arrow that pierced our plain skin and made us fancy women. My wild witch gran, my magic mama, and even these gaudy girls. I like to think you gave us extraordinary power. And to protect us, you became the name we were cautioned to forget. It is enough, you must have murmured, to remember that I was and that you are. Woman, I am Lucille, which stands for light, daughter of Thelma, daughter of Georgia, daughter of dazzling you. Here's a poem about my father. My father was an extremely challenging father. He was an extremely challenging son, an extremely challenging husband, and an extremely challenging human. He was perhaps the smartest man I've ever known. He um, couldn't write, uh, but he was a great reader. There are people who think you can't do both things, you know, that if you can't write, you can't read. I don't understand. It's two different things. But he was a great reader, and so our house was full of books always. A lot of the challenges of him were his fault. A lot of it was his fault. And a lot of it was the fault of the United States of America. This is called Sam. If he could have kept the sky in his dark hand, he would have pulled it down and held it. It would have called him Lord, as did the skinny women in Virginia. If he could have gone to school, he would have learned to write his story and not live it. If he could have done better, he would have. Oh, stars and stripes forever, what did you do to my father? Now, another poem about my father. My father used to always, as I say, he first of all told us that Virginia was heaven. Uh, and he also told us that his family, part of them, used to belong to the family of Robert E. Lee. They were belonged to the Lees. Uh, now, my father was a great liar. Um, you know how they say people won't lie on their deathbed? My father did. On his deathbed, he lied. But I think he wanted to keep something going, you know? And uh, I can understand that. I think he really wanted to just keep something going. This is called Lee. My mother's people belong to the Lees, my father would say. Then spout a litany of names. Old Light Horse Harry, old Robert E. My father, who lied on his deathbed, who knew the truth but didn't always choose it, who saw himself an honorable man, was proud of Lee, that man of honor praised by Grant and Lincoln, worshiped by his men, revered by the state of Virginia, which he loved almost as much as my father did. It may have been a lie. It may have been one of my father's tales. If so, there was an honor in it. If he was indeed to be the child of slaves, he would decide himself, that proud old man. I can see him now, chaining his mother to Lee. Uh, I should write, read you something about my, my mother. My mother wrote poetry. My mother now could write, but she couldn't spell or anything, but you can't have everything. Um, and she wrote very, you know, she wrote iambic pentameter verse, very traditional verse, everything rhymed. And she would sometimes see me writing, and my mother would say, oh, baby, that ain't no poem. Let me show you how to write a poem. And she would, she would do it. Once my mother got a letter about putting some poems in a book. I don't know how this happened. I don't know how it came about. But my father wouldn't let her. Uh, now, I say this is not because he was an evil man. This is because it was the 50s. And in the 50s, people thought, men thought they could do that sort of thing. Uh, you probably don't remember this, but some people are nodding. Yes, during the 50s, husbands thought they could tell you what to do and you were going to do it. It's amazing. That seems so strange. <laughs> but anyway, it just seems bizarre, you know. But anyway, my mother burned her poems in the coal stove. 
And I watched as she did it. And what I remembered, well, this poem happened because I started remembering her hand as she was taking the poems and putting them in the stove. The poem is called Fury for Mama. Remember this. She is standing by the furnace. The coals glisten like rubies. Her hand is crying. Her hand is clutching a sheaf of papers, poems. She gives them up. They burn jewels into jewels. Her eyes are animals. Each hank of her hair is a serpent's obedient wife. She will never recover. Remember, there is nothing you will not bear for this woman's sake. Now, this is a new poem about my grandmother. My grandmother was sanctified. Do you know what that means? You all don't know what sanctified is? Some people do. Yeah, I know. Some people do. Where you get happy. My grandma, if you want to be embarrassed, you let your grandmother get happy. I mean, and she's dancing up and down the aisle, speaking in tongues and carrying on, doing a holy dance. And my brother and I spent a lot of our youth punching, saying, don't get happy, don't shout. You know, I mean, it was only later when I thought about it that I thought about it. My sanctified grandmother spoke in tongues, dancing the syllables down the aisle. She leaned on light as she sashayed through the church hall, conversing with angels. Only now, grown away from embarrassment, only now do I beseech her. I, who would ask the seraphim to speak to me in my own words. Grandmother, help me to enter their mouths. Teach me to lean on understanding, not my own, theirs. Um, I've written a number of poems about abuse. Um, I um, do not take my identity from that, but it's part of what my life is. These are sort of new poems. I was looking through this uh, photo album, and there's a picture of my father. Uh, on his birthday, he would have been uh, 90 years old on December 2nd of 92. And I, I, um, I have spent my life trying to see things wholly. Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean, trying to see things whole. Um, I wish to be seen whole as well. Uh, now, when people don't or have a problem with that, I'm very good at this. If somebody has a problem with me, it is their problem. And I have plenty of problems of my own. I don't need to take on their problem, you know. Um, so trying to see things wholly, which is sometimes difficult, but always rewarding, I think. Anyway, this is a poem written on my daddy's birthday. Album, December 2nd, 92. This lucky old man is my father. He is waving and walking away from damage he has done. He is dressed in his good gray hat, his Sunday suit. He knows himself to be a lucky man. Today is his birthday somewhere. He is 90. What he has forgotten is more than I have seen. What I have forgotten is more than I can bear. He is my father, our father, and all of us still love him. I turn the page, marveling, Jesus Christ, what a lucky old man. I, uh, I like to read something about abuse at every reading. The reason, of course, is that um, I have never read such a poem in any group of more than six people when it has not directly or indirectly touched somebody, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> and also because uh, I, one of the things I like to think that I can do is try to speak for those who have not yet found their voice to speak, try to help people to find a way to deal with some of the things that happens. We live in a culture which does not value children. Uh, if we valued children, we would not have the largest uh, population in poverty as children. Plus, we give a lot of lip service to valuing children, you know? But we don't. 
Uh, as the mother of six children and a friend of many others, uh, I like to try to help. I can tell you about my God. I have a goddaughter who's eight. She's one of my very best friends. She's so wise. Do you want to hear one of her sayings? She said, oh, Lucille, men are wonderful until they get in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> then she said, they just, I don't know. She said, something happens. And I assured her that she probably was right. Uh, I assured her that they're awful wonderful after that, too, actually. I've known some wonderful ones. There's a poem about abuse also, but uh, I had not written it from this angle until I came to Memphis. I don't know why. It's called, What Did She Know? When Did She Know It? In the evenings, what it was, the soft tap, tap into the room, the cold curve of the sheet arced off, the fingers sliding in, and the hard clench against the wall before and after. All the cold air, cold edges, why the little girl never smiled. They are supposed to know everything, our mothers. What did she know? When did she know it? And this poem is uh, a poem that sort of explains why I can write wholly about this matter. It's called Night Vision. The girl fits her body in to the space between the bed and the wall. She is a stalk, exhausted. She will do something with this. She will surround these bones with flesh. She will cultivate night vision. She will train her tongue to lie still in her mouth and listen. The girl slips into sleep. Her dream is red and raging. She will remember to build something human with it. Um, I have a poem about... Uh, about a plantation that I like to read. I visited a plantation in South Carolina. Has anybody ever been to Walnut Grove Plantation in South Carolina? Yeah. Did they talk about slavery? They did? When were you there? No, 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 no. I'm from South Carolina. Oh. I know oh. Well, I visited there uh, because I like to go. I like to see. I love history. Not the story of who won battles. History as it's taught is the story of who won a battle, except for Custer, when it's the story of who lost a battle. It's kind of interesting. Uh, but I like to go to plantations, because I don't have to go, you know. So I want to know what goes on. And uh, I went to Walnut Grove, and it's very interesting, 2,000 acres. Uh, the original furniture's there, the original tools. Uh, my host was the secretary of the Historical Society in South Carolina. I was the only person of color on the tour. That means everybody else was white. I like to give little asides of educational information. Um, and uh, I was interested in this for many reasons. One of them that the school children from Walnut Grove have field trips to that plantation. Field trips to that plantation. Now, half of the children in that town are denied the knowledge that they helped build that place are denied the knowledge, you know? There are some of us who believe that black people, people of color, had no part, Asian people on the West Coast, no part in making this America. And that is not just, you see, and I believe in justice. Anyway, they talked about the tools and all that stuff, and we went all through, 2,000 acres. Outside, there is a burying ground behind the house. I like old cemeteries. Um, where are the slave cemeteries here? Is there one? Really? Really? Thank you. Somebody knew. Somebody always knows. <laughs> All along the roped off path back to this burying ground, there were uh, rocks and wooden crosses, the graves of slaves. But nobody mentioned that. So I asked the secretary, why, why didn't they mention slaves? And he said, maybe they didn't have any. <laughs> and I assured him that in the 1800s in South Carolina, yes, they did, you know. And then he said, uh, and plus they had 2,000 acres, a man, a wife, and two children. 
<laughs> I don't care how many mules you have. You still need somebody. You know, you can't work that way. So then he said, well, maybe because she saw you, she didn't want to embarrass you. And I assured him that I was not a slave and would not have been embarrassed. Um, I was not embarrassed to be the child of such survivors. So, but I suggested that because slaves were considered property, they were inventoried as property, so he should check the inventory. He came back and said they had slaves. I said, whoa, what do you think? <laughs> and then he said, but they only listed 10 because, of course, they didn't count women. Now, I've said lots of times, I hate it when sexism and, rex and racism are mixed up. I don't like it. I like, like, separate paths for my isms, you know? <laughs> And then I decide which one, you know, I know which one to walk down because I know which has most oppressed me, but still it's just more clear that way. So I wanted to write about it, not for anything to happen, but because I witness. I see what I look at, I hear what I listen to, I, play, I try to pay close attention. And you know that when people die, they have here lies so-and-so on there. You know about this? Do you? <laughs> you know people die, don't you? <laughs> That's good information to have, I swear. All right, at the cemetery, Walnut Grove Plantation, South Carolina, 1989. Among the rocks at Walnut Grove, your silence drumming in my bones. Tell me your names. Nobody mentions slaves, but yet the curious tools shine with your fingerprints. Nobody mentioned slaves, but somebody did this work who had no guide, no stone, who molders under rock. Tell me your names, tell me your bashful names, and I will testify. The inventory lists 10 slaves, but only men were recognized. Among the rocks at Walnut Grove, some of these honored dead were dark. Some of these dark were slaves. Some of these slaves were women. Some of them did this honored work. Tell me your names, foremothers, brothers. Tell me your dishonored names. Here lies, here lies, here lies, here lies, here. And thinking about drums, I went to Auction Street. And somebody told me they didn't know why it was called Auction Street. And I do, and I'm from out of town, you know. <laughs> and uh, we saw the, the auction block there, you know. I mean, you know, I've got a poem that says something about history is chasing you, America, like a mean dog. And the only way to get it off your back is to turn around and stare at its face. To deny history, to be ignorant of history, is not protection. We deny it at our peril. To embrace it all wholly is to make us whole. There is no question about that. Anyway, on Auction Street, it was wonderful. And the, the trolley was there. You know, I like trolleys. And then I thought about all the people who have walked down that street to that block. And I have the nerve to have my shoes on there. You know what I mean? I mean, all the vibes and energy that has gone into walking down that street. Auction Street. This is written for Angela McDonald. Consider the drum. Consider Auction Street and the beat throbbing up through your shoes, through the trolley, so that it rides as if propelled by hundreds, by thousands of fathers and mothers led in a coffle to the block. Consider the block, topside, smooth as skin, almost translucent like a drum that has been beaten for the last time and waits now to be honored for the music it had to bear. Then consider Brother Moses, who heard from the mountaintop, take off your shoes. The ground you walk on is holy. Um, now, Gordon said that I, I do mythology and stuff, so I feel that I ought to, to do a couple of things about that. Somebody, somebody always tells me what I do as a poet. And one of the things they say I do is to find the myth in the human and the human in the myth. I attended a lecture about divine visitations. Do you know what I mean? You know how the divine comes to human women sometimes? <laughs> Think about it. You know what I mean? 
Um, Europa and the bull, right? Uh, a star, uh, Lita and the swan. I mean, think about this. You're at home, you're minding your own business. Your daughter comes in, she says, Dad, um, a swan uh, had its way with me. And I'm about to give birth to a divine child. Now, would you go for that? If I were Lita, I wouldn't go for it. You know, I mean, I just don't think, I don't know. Anyway, I've written three poems about Lita, and this last one, Lita 3, is sort of fun to read. It's, uh, the you in this poem is uh, the divine. A personal note, revisitations. Always pyrotechnics. Stars spinning into phalluses of light. Serpents promising sweetness, their forked tongues thick and erect. Patriarchs of bird exposing themselves in the air. This skin is sick with loneliness. You want what a man wants. Next time, come as a man or don't come. <laughs> See, I think Lita had attitude. I think she was a Mediterranean woman and had attitude. Um, I lived in, a, in Southern Maryland in a subdivision. Do you know a subdivision? All the houses are exactly alike. I even have gone to the wrong house sometime. And uh, the reason that I know that, um, that karma is real is because I used to talk about people who lived in subdivisions. You know, I wouldn't think of living. I mean, the conformity of it all. And so um, the universe put me in a subdivision to teach me humility about which I know a bit. So I was living in the subdivision, and you notice what they do. They, in a subdivision, all the houses, there are like three models of houses repeated over and over and over. And they cut down all the trees, and then they name it Fair Oaks, you know, or like Manor Woods. <laughs> Have you done the same thing? This thing is kind of odd. Uh, I was living in the subdivision. I was in the only subdivision part that had a tree, first of all. And my neighbor used to come over and say, you've got a tree. And I said, yes, I was excited. And he said, you've got leaves. And I thought, they go together like that, tree, leaves, you know. <laughs> and I, I knew then that he wouldn't understand anything I said, and I didn't understand anything he said. And I had just come from California. In California, especially northern California, you do not touch a tree unless you are serious, you know. <laughs> you don't go around, like, cutting down people's trees, you know. And here, they just, if there's a space, they'll cut the tree down. And I didn't know that they bulldozed them. I thought, I mean, I thought it was like with an X. I mean, Paul Bunyan and stuff. They take a, it's a bulldozer, have you seen that? And trees are important, you know, if you celebrate life, you celebrate all of it. We live in a culture that celebrates life that looks like us. It's very strange. Anyway, if you notice a lot of things, I think it's strange. I was not feeling well, so I was home from school this day. And in the little space between my house and the next house, there was just enough room for the smallest model of house. So they were cutting down the trees, and when I looked out, and I have a poet's mind. It's a mind that sees connections. This is like this, is like this, is like this, you know? And when I looked out, I could see that this tree, the bulldozers go, and it was, now, first of all, I, you may not believe this, but I love men. I mean, I lo I'm the daughter of a man. I'm the, I was the wife of a man for 30 years. I have two male sons. Uh, <laughs> it's good to have male sons. I um. You know, if anybody has names and addresses, just put them right on a thing here. I've been a widow 10 years, it's a long time. Um, but this was a macho thing happening, you know? This guy was in this bulldozer and he was like, and his friends were around them and suddenly it was Wounded Knee. Suddenly the tree was a warrior and the branches were war bonnets, you know? And there was something going on, so I wanted to write about it. What you should know, let's see. Uh, I only have one good eye. I don't see well. This, this part of my glasses is cosmetic. I'm almost blind in that eye. But this eye sees so much more than is there that I don't even need that eye. Um, I was born with 12 fingers. You know that. Uh, Pahuska was the name the Lakota gave to Custer. You know the Lakota? Yeah. Sometimes, for some reason, we think that the Lakota want to have a French name. Sue. Why do we think that? That's very strange. 
Um, what? It means snake? What? Which does? Like, Sue? Well, you know how we are. Sometimes I think we're kind of cute. Sometimes we're dangerous. I don't know. But anyway, I mean, why would you call, why would not people be able to call themselves who they are themselves? I don't understand. Anyway, they called uh, Custer Pahusco, which means long hair. Something else that's rather interesting is that uh, Crazy Horse and uh, Custer had the same nickname as children. Is this right? They were both, I'm pretty sure this is right, they were both called Curly. Um, it's interesting to me because I'm in love with Crazy Horse, big time. I like little mystic guys like that, and he clearly was. Anyway, you know about Custer. He had a very bad day <laughs> long ago. None of us have been the same. The killing of the trees. The third went down with a sound almost like flaking. A soft swish as the left leaves fluttered themselves and died. Three of them, four, then five, stiffening in the snow, as if this hill were wounded knee, as if the slim feathered branches were bonnets of war, as if the pale man seated high in the bulldozer nest, his blonde mustache ice matted, was Pahuska, come again, but stronger now, his long hair wild and unrelenting. Remember the photograph? The old warrior, his stiffened arm raised as if in blessing, his frozen eyes open, his bark skin brown and not so much wrinkled as circled with age and the snow everywhere still falling, covering his one good leg. Remember his name was Spotted Tail or Hump or Red Cloud or Geronimo or none of these or all of these. He was a chief. He was a tree falling the way a chief falls, straight, eyes open, arms reaching for his mother ground. So I have come to live among the men who kill the trees, a subdivision new in southern Maryland. I have brought my witness eye with me and my two wild hands, the left one sister to the fists pushing the bulldozer against the old oak, the angry right brown and hard and spotted as bark. We come in peace, but this morning, ponies circle what is left of life, and whales and continents and children and ozone and trees huddle in a camp weeping outside my window. And I can see it all with that one good eye. Um, just to show you, I want to read three more poems. Um, to show you the danger of, of that kind of naming, not allowing people to be named, uh, perhaps you know and you'll correct me if I'm wrong. We, there's a person famous in history called um, Young Man Afraid of His Horses. And you know what the real translation is? Young man who is so fierce, even his horses are feared. Now, how do we make that young man afraid of his horses? That's a whole nother world, people. <laughs> Interesting. Anyway, um, three more. I suddenly wanted to read this poem, if I can find it. Uh, amuse yourselves. <laughs> um, wait a minute. Oh, this is called, It Was a Dream. I've never read this. It Was a Dream, in which my greater self rose up before me, accusing me of my life with her extra finger whirling in a gyre of rage at what my days had come to. What, I pleaded with her, could I do? Oh, what could I have done? And she twisted her wild hair and sparked her wild eyes and screamed as long as I could hear her, this, this, this. Second to last, this is a poem called Shadows. It was written in Memphis also. I was trying to make the connection between Memphis and the Memphis and Egypt and, and the pyramid. 
um, is that pretty? Because <laughs> um, I don't know. And Ramses, isn't that Ramses that's in front of it? It's interesting. Uh, it's very interesting. I'm trying to make connections, and, and I spend a lot of time, I'm always trying to figure out what things mean, you know? I, what do I mean? I try to figure that out. What do things mean? And sometimes we think we know, but I'm not sure we do. Shadows. In the latter days, you will come to a place called Memphis. There you will wait for a while by the river Mississippi until you can feel the shadow of another Memphis and another river, Nile. Wake up, girl, you dreaming. The sign may be water or fire, or it may be the black earth or the black blood under the earth, or it may be the syllables themselves coded to you from your southern kin. Wake up, girl, I swear you're dreaming. Memphis, capital of the old kingdom of ancient Egypt at the apex of the river across from the great pyramids, Nile, born in the mountains of the moon. Wake up, girl, this don't connect. Wait there. In the shadow of your room, you may see another dusky woman weakened by too much loss. She will be dreaming a small boat through centuries of water into the white new world. She will be weaving garments of neglect. Wake up, girl, this don't mean nothing. Meaning is the river of voices. Meaning is the patience of the moon. Meaning is the thread running forever in shadow. Girl, wake up. Somebody calling you. And I'd like to end with a poem I've, I've taken to ending with. And this poem, it stands for me, but I've also found that a, a lot of people and things can, can uh, relate to it. It perhaps is, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I've read so many, I read a whole lot in my life. Today, I think too much, but... Um, it is interesting how alike people are, you know, how alike humans are. Once you get past the superficial, the circumstances of lives are different. Um, but people inside are all motivated by the same things, all want the same things. I am amazed when people say, what do women want? What do black people want? I want what you want. You know, that's what I want. What do you want? I want that, you know. Um, it's just interesting to me. Uh, I often think that this is a world that ought to be made comfortable for difference, comfortable for difference, because the natural state of humans is difference. It's not like the natural state of people is white and then there's some, some auxiliary folks. It is the natural state of flowers to be different. It is the natural state of humans to be different. And that's fine. And this poem, I think, relates to me, to poetry, maybe even to Memphis. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come, celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer questions if you'd like. You have a question? Okay. I wanted to ask you, you said earlier that you felt, you felt that it was important that as a poet that you represent and you speak to people who cannot speak 
Well, we've not yet been able to. Yes. Uh, now, do you feel that that is one of the main purposes of poetry? Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't begin to think poetry is is really a very natural human thing. Um, it is. I don't know what its purpose is. To remind us of something larger than ourselves, perhaps. You know, it does so many things. Poetry can be. It can be. Uh, it can make differences. That Walnut Grove poem. I should say that I read that one time, and there was a woman in the audience. Uh, who was the head of the restoration committee at Walnut Grove. And she wrote to me, I got this letter about half a year ago, they are changing the tour, they are redoing the whole guide, they are rebuilding a slave cabin, they are involving everybody who used to live at that plantation. Just from one poem, hearing that poem. Um, I think poetry is the, might be about reminding us that there is something beyond ourselves. I really do. We forget that poetry didn't start in the academy, you know. Poetry is a circumstance of, la language is a circumstance of poetry. But I would not, you know, I've got a poem that says, I keep hearing tree words, water, tree talk, water words, and I keep knowing what they mean. The fact that I don't understand bird poems doesn't mean there aren't any, you know what I mean? And it seems to me the first, the first poem, which is a natural urge inside humans to express, uh, didn't come from a classroom, but came when somebody walked out of a cave in Europe or somebody walked off a savanna and looked up at the sky and was filled with wonder and made a noise. I think that was the first poem. Its purpose is to remind us that there is something beyond the self, I think. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, something else? Yes, yes, sir. Oh, what started, I've been writing since I was a little girl. I didn't know I could be a poet. I never saw any after all. The only poets I ever saw were the portraits that hung on the walls of Buffalo, New York, old dead white men with beards from New England. <laughs> so of course I had no concept that I was, you know, could join that number. Um, but my parents were great readers. I loved language. I've heard some good preaching in my time. And that's why I use oral language. I am interested in the oral tradition. Um, I think what got me started was, um, was just wanting to express and using language as a way to do that. I never, I, by the time I was first published, which was in 1969, and ladies, when I was first published in 1969, my children were seven, five, four, three, two, and one. Um, I had been writing for over 20 years. Not wishing to be a poet, wishing to write poems, that has always been my first thing. Now, what I want to leave a reader with, I used to say that if I was ever going to change my name to an African name, which many of my friends did, um, I would want to have on my tombstone the name Jiribu, which means one who tries. Uh, I would like to be somebody who has tried to every day be the best person I can be that day, the, to live up to what being human is, because I'm very... I feel very strongly that we all have us, in us the possibility of evil. Uh, it's better to think that way. A lot of times we think that all the bad stuff happens over there. Somebody over there, they're born with like a big E on their <laughs> T-shirt. But personal responsibility for evil, you know. And then, I mean, it's those negative vibes follow. Auden says, those to whom evil are done do evil in return. Um, so I try every day to live with a sense of humor which has saved my life on more than one occasion, and to the best that I can be that day. Every morning I wake up saying, today I am not going to hate anybody. Every day, sometime during the day, I almost do. <laughs> no, seriously. And I say, oh, oh God, I forgot. You know? <laughs> well, that happens, you know, that happens. <laughs> That's another question, actually, I don't know. <laughs> Something else? Yeah. Yes. Celebrate with me. Is that in a collection? Yes, that's in the Book of Light. And this is a great cover. Okay. This cover was done by an Afro-Asian woman named Jody Kim, lives in Seattle. I think it's a great cover. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something else? Yes, sir. Well, you 
you have to work on, you know, um, uh, who was it that said, uh, Philip Larkin said, poems don't start with ideas, they start with poetry. And what I remember there is in seeing the connection, I see connections to things all the time. And seeing that, I started feeling and thinking. Uh, creativity comes from a balance of intuition and intellect. Intuition and intellect. And my process is to have stuff going on for a long time inside my head. That has to happen, or inside myself. That has to happen because I had so many kids. My kids are only six and a half years apart in age. Yes, I was on the pill. No, I'm not Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to have my process. It had to be what it needed to be, you know? Somebody once asked me, what is the, what is the best uh, circumstance for writing poems? I said, have six children, four diapers. I mean, obviously. Um, <laughs> So by the time I go to typing, and I, I compose on a typewriter or a word processor, I cannot write longhand. I, I don't start at A and go to D, I start at L and go to D. And then I have to work on it, of course. I have to help the poet become what it seems to want to be. Not what I want it to be, because I want them all to say, I, I want them all to end, she is a wonderful person and cute as the day. I want to help the poem. I am a servant of the poem. Each one. Richard Wilbur said it is always life or death. As I had forgotten. For each one. You know. uh, using an oral language, which is the language I hear, and hearing the music in the language. The American tongue is a very musical tongue. Very musical. But you have to read poems in order to, to get to be confident with that. A lot of poets don't, a lot of poets love their poetry. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you want to love it all. It's like humans. If you love them, love them all. Um, poetry, love it all. I mean, that doesn't mean you resonate to every kind of poem. I don't. But I respect them all, and it's a wide world of poetry. We have been taught poetry as if it was the world of those old dead white men with beards from New England. But American poetry, I am a contemporary American poet. Contemporary American poetry looks like America. It doesn't look like just a little bit of America. Joy Harjo is a contemporary American poet. Lee Young Lee is a contemporary American poet. You know? Linda Hogan is a contemporary American poet. Nick. Lots of them. Richard Wilbur. Contemporary American poetry looks just like America looks. Which is good. It's as it should be. Something else? Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, if you have, a, have you ever noticed, if you have a lot of children, you draw children. They like smell you, and like children come. So I always had a lot of children around. Uh, I have, when the first Everett Anderson, I have seven books about a little boy named Everett Anderson. When the first one was written, my oldest son was six. And when the second one was written, my second son was six. And there have been seven. I wanted to write about a child who lived in the projects, because a project is not an apartment. People are trying to get into the apartments from the projects. Nobody in the apartment is trying to get into the projects. Uh, or at least nobody I know, <laughs> not for good reason. Um, I wanted to write about poor children so that children could see that, uh, that poverty is not a matter of character. You know, to be poor in things is not to be poor in spirit. I wanted to, he was a child in the first Everett Anderson, only lives with his mother um, because a lot of people don't live in this uh, two parent, two sibling, two pits, one fence family. Uh, and he just uh, just grew. I have watched children. I like kids. I like a lot. My, my friends, as I say, Eva, my kindergarten wise person, uh, is my good friend. A lot of kids are my good friends. I went to a school here, and it's interesting. Uh, I think this has to do with self-esteem or something. I went to Westwood School. Is that where I said I went? And the children are so sweet. The first thing the children said to me was, you're not from Memphis. <laughs> you know? I said, yes, I live in Memphis. Wow. Like somebody in Memphis wrote these books. You know, it's interesting. Something else? Well, thank you very much. I hope you'll come tomorrow to our um, workshop reading.
we, we're having a little get-together for Lucille over at the home of Dr. Tom Carlson. Um, and we have maps to the place. It's over on Shady Oak between Poplar and Walnut Grove, Shady Grove. Uh, Mark, are you here? Donde esta nuestras mapas? On the back table. On the back table. And uh, pick up the map and come over. We, we have a kind of BYO, but, but the university, the English department, are furnishing a nice, a nice buffet for us. Come over to Tom Carlson's and meet Lucille. Bring your books for autographing. Thank you and good evening.